All right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, no matter where you are in the world. My name is Brian Foster. I'm a content director here at PINCAP, and I'll be your MC for today's webinar. We're very excited to provide a sneak peek into our upcoming serverless platform, TidyB Serverless, which will be generally available in the coming weeks. In today's webinar, PINCAP software engineer Charles Zhang explores the challenges of building our serverless platform and how we overcame them by re-architecting several core components of TidyB. We will also demo several technical components of our solution. Charles has approximately five years of experience building large-scale cloud-native systems. He is also a maintainer and member of several open-source communities, including Kubernetes, OpenYurt, and KubeWorf. Before we get started, please feel free to drop your questions directly in the chat window. We'll be sure to answer them during the Q&A portion at the end of the talk. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Charles. Charles, the floor is yours. All right, thanks. Thanks, Brian, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so thanks for joining us today. I am uh, Charles, software engineer at PINCAP. Today, I'm going to introduce TidyB Serverless, our new HTAP database service for agile app development. Here is an outline of today's talk. First, we will discuss what is serverless, why so many people say serverless is the future of cloud computing, why we need to make TidyB Cloud serverless, and what are some major challenges. Then I will explain how we approach these challenges, how TidyB serverless work internally. And finally, we will show a demo the demo will show how we can create TidyB serverless instantly and uh, uh, how users can use it as easy as using a water fussy. And also the demo will show the TidyB serverless as the first HTAP serverless product on the market can provide a powerful HTAP ability. First, let's talk about the serverless in general. Everyone in the cloud industry is talking about serverless from large cloud providers to individual SaaS providers. Just like you will be left behind if you don't provide a serverless option for your product. So what is serverless? Is it a specific system architecture or a technology? Let's take a look at two popular serverless database products on AWS. Is serverless something like the DynamoDB which claims to be a fully managed scalable service, providing high throughput, large data volume, and high concurrency with extremely low latency. Or something like the Arola serverless, which claims to be able to support various unpredictable workloads with the capability to scale instantly and fit with the pay as usage pricing model. We think they are all very attractive features and the serverless products should include them all. But more specifically, in our opinion, serverless is not about a particular architecture or technology. It is a category of cloud products that are able to support all kinds of workloads and it does not require customer to know anything about underlying infrastructure, like how many servers need to be provisioned, should I choose virtual machine over container? Also, serverless products need to fit with the pay-as-you-go uh, pay pricing model, and it should be easy to use. Now, we have to explain what is serverless and briefly mention some of its benefits, but there is no free lunch. All benefits come with price. Do we really need serverless considering our dedicated TidyB Cloud has already received many positive feedback and the customer are happy with it. Next, let's try to look at this question from the perspective of both customer and the provider. For customers, serverless products can largely reduce the infrastructure management efforts. No more capacity planning, no more resource waste. The application developers only need to focus on their own business logic and a serverless can help them to bring new service and the features to market more quickly. For the, per, for the provider, serverless can help them to reduce the operational cost as they can use a shared infrastructure to provide service to all users 
instead of maintaining identical infrastructure for each tenant. Serverless can also help to increase the resource utilization as all users will share a same underlying resource pool, which allow provider to eliminate the resource fragmentation more easily. Last but not least, applying serverless can enhance the customer's experience since now the providers will be responsible for tuning the system to be best suited to the user's workloads, which avoid the suboptimal performers due to misconfiguration. But every benefit comes with a cost. We want all users to share the infrastructure. Then how can we provide an adequate level of isolation between them with high scalability? We want to build a platform suits with the pay as usage pricing model. Then the system must scale fast. In other words, how can we ensure it is extremely elastic? Also, different from other status software, database usually need to maintain the user data with strong consistency and durability, which poses a unique challenge that how can we store the data in cost effective manner when user are away? These are just a partial list of challenges we run into along the journey of building TiDB serverless. But fortunately, we knew that cloud native is the future since the day one when we start building the TiDB. Therefore, TiDB is born for the cloud native era, and we believe it can be extended to fit with the serverless model perfectly. Next, let's dive into the details and introduce how TiDB serverless work internally. Here is the overall system architecture. From top down, we have a shared gateway layer being responsible for handling the user request and forwarded to the desired TiDB server. A stateless computing layer containing the server pool for all stateless components. A shared storage layer providing multi-tenant interface based on TiKV. And a brand new cloud storage engine layer built on the modern cloud infrastructure and is tailor-made for TiDB serverless. First, let's talk about the isolated computing layer. Why we call it isolated? Because all components in this layer will work for one tenant at a time. In the other words, at any given moment, a single component won't be shared by two users. To help you better understand the design of this layer, let's take a look at the architecture of an original TiDB cluster. TiDB is an HTAP database that can handle both transactional processing and analytic processing workloads. As shown in the figure, on the top, we have a group of TiDB server instance. Each of the instance is in charge of parsing SQL query and generate the query execution plan. Since each TiDB server will not store any data directly, it can just be treated as a regular stateless service. In the lower left, we have the TiKV cluster storing the data in a row format using multi wrapped to ensure data consistency between replicas. In the lower right, we have the TiFlash cluster being responsible for storing data in column format and executing queries for analytical workloads. It asynchronously reads data from TiDB, uh, TiKV cluster as each TiFlash data region will join the Raft group as a learner. As we can see, both TiKV and TiFlash cluster are stable as they need to store user data, and only the TiDB compute layer is stateless. However, stateless servers naturally fits with the serverless model better, as user components can be safely recycled when they are not in use. In other words, system with more stateless components will fit with the serverless model better. So can we do better? Can we re-architect our system and convert more stable components into status? If you remember, for the transactional processing part, the compute and the storage has been fully decoupled. But for the analytical processing part, the type flash node will do both computing and the storage. So can we further decouple the type flash node into status computing part and the stable storage part? To achieve this, we need to resolve a problem. If you are familiar with TiFlash, 
you may know that TieFlash has relatively high query processing throughput, comparing to other analytical processing engine. This is because we introduced a massive parallel processing mechanism since TieFlash 5.0, which avoids the single node bottleneck by allowing peer-to-peer -peer data transfer between multiple TieFlash nodes. So how can we ensure the MPP mechanism can still work after we decoupling the compute and the storage? To tackle this problem, we redesigned the type flash internal architecture. We split the type flash node into type flash compute and type flash storage, and split the peer to peer data transfer into write transfer and read transfer. That is to say, type flash storage node will be able to read data between each other, and we can update the intermediate state of the query cross type flash compute nodes. After implementing this design, we are able to decouple computing and storage for an analytical workload completely. And we can get a more clean architecture like this, a status compute layer including only the status compute engine on the top and a stateful storage layer containing a row and a column store on the bottom. For those who are interested, we use Kubernetes to orchestrate all the microservice and the subcomponents. To shorten the bootstrap time, we will warm up a group of compute servers and use pop pool to manage them. We use a per user token to control the mapping relationship between an individual user and a group of computer servers. The server pools will automatically scale up and down based on the network traffic and other system metrics. Next, let's talk about the shared storage layer. Why we, like, why we would like to have a shared storage layer. If we can let users to share the backend storage, we can further reduce the storage fragmentation as the placement driver will have a global view of data stores belonging to different users and come up with better placement plan. A shared storage layer can also help us to increase the CPU utilization as all users will share an expression calculation framework. For those who are not familiar with TiDB, TiDB server will split a complex query into many small expression and push down to the expression calculation framework embedded in the TiKV cluster. So if we can have all users share the storage, we can get a maximum use of the expression calculation framework. A shared storage layer has many benefits, but it is also necessary to be highly scalable as more user data it can store, the higher resource efficiency it can achieve. And it should also be provide good isolation as the neighbor interference can largely affect the quality of service. So can TIKV provide high scalability as well as good isolation? To answer this question, let's first take a look at the TIKV system architecture. The TIKV nodes are on the bottom. We split the data into regions, which is subset of the data. For example, we split the complete data set into five subsets, which are five regions. Each region contains multiple replica, which are sp spread across different TIKV nodes. In most of the cases, three replicas should be enough. On the top, we have the TIKV client communicating with the TIKV cluster through the gRPC protocol. And on, a, on the top right, we have the placement driver, which is the scheduler of the TIKV cluster. It is in charge of generating global monolithic and a unique timestamp for each transaction. Manage all data regions across TIKV nodes, like rebalancing regions, migrate regions from offline nodes to active nodes, and store the metadata of all regions. As we can see, we divide large data sets into small regions with each region containing several replicas making up their own raft group. The number of replicas may change depends on how TIKV nodes are spread geographically. But in most of the cases, each single TIKV node does not need to store the full copy of the data. That is to say, TIKV is horizontal scalable. When a volume of data is increasing, we can simply scale out the TIKV cluster by adding more nodes. Here are two large real-world TIKV cluster. 
The left is one of our user streets. It is a TidyB cluster backed by a large TikeV cluster, consists of 168 nodes with 1,820 billion rows and 318 terabytes of data, which need to support 100 million reads and 87,000 writes per second. The user thought it is the largest one, but soon we had a larger one, which consists of 212 nodes and it can hold up to 827 terabytes of data. We have not tried yet, but we did not experience any pressure with this cluster. So I believe we can actually grow larger. So the TIKV is highly scalable by natural. Then the next question is, can TIKV provide isolation better between users? TIKV use prefix to group keys. That is to say, keys share same prefix will be grouped together and placed near to each other. This mechanism makes it very easy to support multi-tenancy in TIKV. We can simply add a prefix for keys belonging to the same users. Then common operation like date, lookup, and the scan can still be very efficient. So since TIDB 6.4, we officially added key space support to the TIKV. In addition, to support the key space, there is no need to change the TIKV components. All functionality can be implemented in the placement driver and its client. And some advanced feature like tenant level resource control framework and tenant level resource metering are currently under heavy development and will be ready very soon. For those who are interested, here is the system architecture with the key, value, key space enabled. We will store the key space metadata in PD and the TIDB servers will use new PD client to query the user key space information and sending the request to the correct TIKV regions. Even though the key value entries will be organized by key prefix, but the TIKV itself is agnostic to all this. The shared storage layer provides an interface to the upper layer compute engine, but we also need to backend storage engine manage the data store in a cost efficient way. In the original TIDB cluster, we used the RocksDB as a storage engine for each TIKV node. We leveraged the RocksDB to persist the data into the local file system. We did not implement a local key value store from scratch, as implementing a high performance local key value store requires a lot of efforts, and RocksDB has been proven to be reliable with predictable performance in production by many data management systems. Be more specific, in each TIKV node, we have two RocksDB instance, one for storing raft lock, another for storing the data region. This setup works well in most cases. It can scale well with good fault tolerance and the predictable performance. However, this setup is not cheap, but for a serverless platform, the cost effectiveness is very important. To better understand why using RocksDB can be costly in a cloud environment, let's take a look at how it works internally. There are several important concepts in RocksDB, the memory table, write ahead log, sorted string table, and a log structure merge tree. The mem table is an in-memory data structure that stores the most recent updates of the database, providing a fast and efficient way to read. Um, when a map table is full, it will convert into an active map table, which is immutable, then be converted to sorted uh, string table file, which contain a sorted string table, flushed to disk and become part of the log structure merge tree. The write ahead log is a durable log that stores all updates to the database before they are written to the map table. This ensures that if the database crash or lose power, the change can be recovered from the write ahead lock. What are some problems of this setup in the cloud environment? First, to ensure the date durability, we usually store data on SSDs across three available zones, which can result in high storage cost. Additionally, separate uh, compacting SST files on each instance can lead to high CPU cost. 
and a slow date migration can cause inefficient scaling and a low elasticity. There can also be performance fluctuation when there are compaction, garbage collection, and a snapshotting undergoing. Furthermore, having a large number of regions can result in high heartbeat transfer rates, and this setup also makes it difficult to strike a balance between achieving a better query plan and ensuring predictable performance, as a good query plan requires collecting system statistics more frequently from a tight KV node, which may cause the system performance degradation. Overall, these challenges pose significant trade-off for optimizing the performance and the cost efficiencies of a distributed database system. In other words, RocksDB may not be the best feed for tight KV in a cloud-native environment. We understand that important optimization require fundamental change. Many problems have been solved by the cloud infrastructure already. Leverage the cloud infrastructure can greatly reduce our cost. So we decided to build a new storage engine based on the modern cloud infrastructure. And first, we need to decide which storage servers we are going to use. There are two common options offered by cloud providers object storage and block storage. We compare them from five perspectives and found that object storage tend to have lower storage cost as it is designed to store large amount of data for a long period of time. Virtually unlimited storage capacity, which can be easily scaled to petabytes or even exabytes, and a better durability as it usually stores data across multiple data centers. On the other hand, Block storage has lower latency as it is designed for high performance application that require fast access to data and almost a non-cost per request as it is built based on the amount of data provisioned. So can we get the best of both words? Namely, we want a new storage engine to come with lower storage cost, unlimited storage capacity, high durability, low latency, and almost no per request cost. To achieve this goal, we, describe, we decide to develop a new cloud storage engine using both object storage and block storage internally. Here is the high-level system architecture of a Thai KV cluster using the new cloud storage engine. A Thai KV cluster will still located in one geographic region. We will replace the old RocksDB storage engine with the new cloud storage engine for key value storage. Also, instead of storing the raft log in RocksDB, now we will store the raft log in a newly developed raft engine. Inside the cloud storage engine, the raft engine will use the EBS as the storage backend. And then the KV engine will use the EBS as you will use the local SSD as the local data cache and persist the local structure merge tree to an S3 bucket for data durability. Let's take a look at how the new storage engine work internally. We will leverage the log structure merge tree to persist the key value store. But instead of have all regions share a log structure merge tree, we let each region to have its own dedicated merge tree and also increase the size of each region from 96 megabytes to one gigabyte. Some reason behind this design are, we can balance the region more efficiently as now region balancing is just a copy data from S3 to the local SSD. We can improve the scalability as there is no more global log on a single merge tree. If you are familiar with the RocksDB, you may have heard about the right amplification problem. But now we have small merge tree with less level, which will largely reduce the right amplification problem. Also, we develop a new raft engine for persisting raft log into the block storage. And there will be no write ahead log anymore. Instead, in case of system crash, the MAM table can be recovered from raft log in EBS. Then, if we try to write some data, we will first write the raft log to EBS before updating the MAM table. When the MAM table is full, the engine will convert it into SST table, persist the SS table to S3 before writing them to the local RSMG. 
The local SS table will act as a cache for key value store. Additionally, on a leader will only a leader will trigger data flush and compaction, which improved the overall CPU utilization. We are going to have remote dedicated servers for compacting and the statistic analyzing on S3, which help to avoid CPU performance fluctuation as running compaction and data collection frequently may consume more extra CPU cycles. A neural called witness can be added to the raft loop and the witness nodes do not need to store any data and it can help us to speed up the consensus. Here are some benefits we can get after using a new storage engine. One of the key advantage is data durability is largely improved through integration with S3, since S3 can offer reliability and highly available storage. People may question that the storage engine uses both EBS and S3, so it must be more expensive. But actually, since the S3 has already helped us to ensure the data durability, we only need to use the local SSD as cache and avoid extra cross-zone network traffic, which significantly reduce the storage cost. Also, we can use remote spot instance for data compaction and the statistical analysis, which help us to reduce CPU cost and minimize performance fluctuation. By loading data from F3, the system can scale more quickly and efficiently, making the whole platform more elastic. Moreover, their independent LSMG in each region help us to mitigate the side effects of hotspot write. Larger and less data region means fewer heartbeat message, which can also help us to reduce the network traffic. The cloud storage engine enable a lot a more efficient collection of fresh statistics, as we can have a dedicated remote server collecting data from the F3, which can help us to generate better query optimization plan. Finally, the new cloud storage engine is just like a large framework. We have built up the scaffolding framework already and implemented some core function. But there are many optimizations are undergoing right now believe the cloud storage engine will bring us more benefits in the future. Um, we have seen how TiDB serverless work internally. I know it's a little bit complicated, but next let's do a brief demo and you will see how easy it is to use the TiDB serverless. Okay, so after you log in to the, your TiDB cloud account, you will see the TiDB cloud council like this. As you can see, um, I do not have any cluster available under my organization or under my name. So first, let's try to create a cluster. Under the cluster creation tabs, let's choose the serverless tier. Let's name the cluster serverless demo. Um, currently, serverless tier only support AWS, but we can choose the region. Since I am located in California, I will choose the nearest region, which is Oregon, US West 2. And then let's just click Create. Okay, we have been redirected back to the Cloud Council. As we can see, we have a serverless cluster under provisioning. What's happening right now is we are going to get a TiDB server and match this request to the server in a setup connection. As you can see, a serverless tier can be available uh, within just 10 seconds. Then let's see what's inside a serverless TiDB cluster. Here we have a summary of the cluster. We have a serverless tier cluster named the serverless demo with the status available, TiDB version 6.4 on AWS running on region Oregon, US West 2. On the right-hand side, we have the monitoring panel since we have not executed any query yet, so the monitoring panel is empty. Um, if you wanted to connect to this TiDB serverless cluster, we, you may like to use some database uh, command line tool or other popular API like JDBC, Python, or Go. We provide a very handy functionality to automatically generate the command line. For example, here, it can generate the command line for the MySQL client. 
and can also generate the API you need to embed it into your code. Yeah, but for this demo, I'm not going to use any terminal tool or any code. I'm going to use our new interactive interface, which is called chat to query. This is our brand new interactive interface that is powered by OpenAI, and it can generate the query, SQL query, uh, based on what you put in this dialog box. Um, on the left-hand side, we will have the overview of the database, uh, which including all the available database and the tables. On the right-hand side, we have one dialog box powered by AI and will generate the uh, SQL query based on what you put in here. And on the bottom, we have the query log and also the uh, result block. Okay. Um, we will come back to this interface later. Let's finish. Let's, let's take a look at the other tabs. The next one is the import tab. So this app allow us to import existing data using CVS file into our TiDB serverless cluster. And uh, also next is a full monitoring, a detailed monitoring panel, including more system indicator and the performance metrics. And the last one is the playground, another interactive interface, which allow users to try out our new and advanced features it will also highlight some of the key features of TiDB serverless, like the HTAP capability, the MySQL compatibility. Um, to, uh, to those who are not aware, TiDB is MySQL compatible. So if you have a MySQL database, you can easily migrate your workloads from your older database to TiDB serverless seamlessly. And the last, we have another dialog box. This box um, is similar to the chat to query. But difference is once you execute a SQL query inside this box, um, it will generate the explanation of the query strategy and also some runtime statistics. Yeah, we will come back to this box and use this one to show the HTAP capability later. Now, let's just go back to the chat to query and let's try to show some basic functionality of TiDB serverless. First, I wanted to show the basic usage, like can we just uh, run some OLTP, very classic OLTP query. As we can see here, we create a sample database, which including some sample data, which you can use to play around and try out the TiDB serverless feature. Um, let's see the sold car order table. Okay, so this table stored all the information of sold the car for the last year. So for example, we wanted to we wanted to run some very basic um, OLTP query. Then let's just put it here. And uh, for example, we wanted to see the sold the car information with the price range from 400,000 to 600,000 with the fuel type petrol. Let's ask execute the query and a yes. So in a query log, let's expand a query log. We can see that this query has been finished within 15 milliseconds with numbers uh, in a fetch number 383 numbers of rows. Okay. Uh, so the next feature I wanted to show is the chat to query feature, our latest AI powered SQL query generation features. So if you are someone like me who is not good at writing um, SQL query, um, I know it sounds a little bit weird. I'm working for a database company, but I'm not good at writing SQL query. But anyway, but if you are someone like me and uh, one of your coworker may want you to help them to write some SQL query, then what could you do? Now with the chat to query features, you don't need to worry it anymore. You can just put in some natural language and it will generate the query for you. So um, let's see another example of the query. So for example, we have a table here called GitHub events, which store all the GitHub events, um, like the commit issue or repository. And we wanted to, for example, we wanted to calculate the total number of commits, addition and the deletion per month for each user for 2022 then what we get. 
let's just let AI to help us to generate the SQL query. Um, so what's happening in the background is this one will send the request to the AI backend and generate the SQL query. And then we can use it to run the query to execute and get the data we want. Okay. Okay. So here is the query generated by AI. Uh, if you don't like it, don't worry. It will gen just generate as a common. So it will not be just run after it is generated, but you can just uh, simply click the tab and it will become a real query. And you can execute this query and it, boom, it's fetch back the data we want. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the next interface. Let's go to the playground interface. So next feature I wanted to show is the HTAB capability. Um, so as you know that TidyB is an HTAB database, which means it can handle not only the transactional processing workload, but can also handle the analytics processing workload very efficient. And the good news is for TidyB Solis, the HTAB capability is enabled by default. So let's see how HTAB can help you to accelerate accelerate the query execution, um, run, uh, accelerate the query execution and efficiency. So first, let's try to see something without HTAB. So same for the GitHub events. For example, we wanted to group group by all the GitHub events by year and uh, sort the uh, events in a descending order. So here is the query we are going to use. And we add a comment here. This comment means we are going to use the Thai KV. We are not going to use the HTAB capability. So let's run the query. So as you can see, the query has been finished within 82, uh, 82 milliseconds. And let's see the explanation of the query. Okay, so this query has been decop uh, has been decomposed to many sub expression and pushed down to Thai KV. Next, let's try to see if we are going to use the Thai Flash to run this query. So we can just simply remove these comments because Thai Flash has been enabled by default on Thai uh, TidyB serverless. Then let's execute this query. Okay. So the execution time, this, the runtime for this query is only nine milliseconds. So we increase the execution time by several times. And let's see the explanation. So as we can see, the query has been decoupled into many small sub expression and pushed down to Thai flush using a massive parallel processing mechanism we mentioned in previous slides. Okay. Um, so feel free to try out this HTAP, um, HTAP functionality on TidyB serverless. And the last, let's go back to the monitoring panel. Since we have successfully run several queries, so the monitoring panel will display some of the interesting um, system statistics that may help you to debug and monitoring your system. Okay. So yeah, so that's the brief demo of TidyB serverless. Um, and here is the summary of today's talk. So we discussed the importance of a good architecture for a serverless platform and how it may require fundamental change in the original system architecture. We then look at TidyB's architecture, which supports the serverless model by natural. However, there is still room for improvement so we improve the resource utilization. We use the server pools for managing status components. Um, to address the isolation level concerns, we introduce the concept of key space to Thai KV. And finally, we invent a brand new cloud storage engine based on a state-of-art cloud infrastructure to improve the cost efficiency. So that's all for today's talk. Please try out our TidyB serverless. If you have any questions, please reach out to our experts or just to shoot me an email. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Charles, for this excellent presentation and demo. Now let's see if we have any questions from our audience. <clears throat> okay, I have one here. What will happen when the storage engine restarts? Okay, um, that's a good question. 
So the engine will recover to an incomplete state containing only the data before the last SST flushing, and it will not contain any data used to be in a map table. So different from the original Thai KV setup, we move the region meta into the raft engine, and then the storage engine will load all raft logs between the apply index and the committed index from the raft engine and apply them. Yeah. Excellent. No, thanks for your answer. That's that's really great. Let's see if we have any others here. Okay, how how does remote compaction work? Um, so TIKV will send HTTP request with file IDs to the compaction server. The compaction server will load files from S3 into memory, generate new data in the memory, and then upload the new data to S3. So after the compaction has successfully finished, the TIKV will respond to upcoming requests occurring in the same regions with new file IDs, and all this work can be done on a spot instance at a very cheap price. Yeah. Wow, nice. Okay, let's see if we have others. All right, well, here's one. Why did we develop a new Raft engine? Um, yeah, so since we removed the right ahead log, as I mentioned in the slides, we need to store more Raft log and the Raft logs within a large range. So a single region may be read and the performance has to be good enough. Also for large regions, the MAM table may take a long time to flush. It may block the Raft engine state file and prevent it to, from being deleted. Um, and an older Raft engine we used before cannot meet this performance requirements. So that's the reason why we developed a new one. Yeah. Gotcha. No, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Let me see here. All right. One, it looks like we have one other question. Can you elaborate on how the new Raft engine works? Um, yeah. So it will keep the new, new Raft engine, it will keep the latest Raft log in memory for faster reading and writing. Um, and the new Raft engine will use the pen only files to write the Raft log for all regions. Um, when a file reaches a certain size, we will rotate it. Meanwhile, the old paneling files are compacted into multiple files in the background, and we will remove the in-memory raft the log after the per-region file is written. Um, when truncating, uh, truncating the raft the log, we will remove the per-region file if the last raft the log in a file is smaller than the uh, truncated index. Yeah. Gotcha. No, that's that's a great answer. All right, just looking through here. Okay, I guess yeah, that looks like that looks like that's it uh, right Sweet. now. So, yeah, you know, again, th you know, thank you everyone, you know, for attending today's talk. We'll definitely make sure recordings available to everyone who registered for the event, and that'll be available in the coming days. So, um, and additionally, you know, stay tuned for more information about TidyB Serverless in the com coming weeks. Um, we look forward to sharing more with you all very very soon. And with that, ha have a wonderful day, everyone.